Perfect. So once again, um, welcome board members, uh, welcome Linden Place members and friends, um, welcome new faces. I'm delighted to have you all with us. And, um, you know, I'm very excited for tonight's um, talk with Charles Roberts. Um, Charles and I uh, met back in 2017 when he was first starting uh, the Slave History Medallion Project. And you know, he, if, if you know Charles, you know he just oozes enthusiasm and he energizes um, everyone around him um, with his passion for history and with his knowledge. So without further ado, um, because I know several of you are here specifically to hear Charles speak, we will start first with him in our program. A couple of things I think I mentioned, um, I will be showing a lot of um, some photographs and a couple of videos and you might need to have a little patience with me <laughs> with the technical aspect of things. Um, I would ask, and it looks like everyone here is pretty good at um, having um, muted themselves while they're not speaking. Um, if you can keep yourself on mute, unless you're speaking, that would be great. Um, we will have time for questions. Um, at which point, Christy Nadalin, who is a Linden Place board member, will help facilitate questions. So at some point, if you have a question, you can um, type that in the chat, um, in the chat icon, and we'll pick up questions towards the end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we'll do instead of, of Charles speaking kind of lecture style, it, it's more of a conversation. Um, Charles and I will go back and forth um, kind of like a QA. and a um, So it, it's a little more of a relaxed feel. Uh, for people who um, aren't familiar with Charles, Charles Roberts hails from Newport and he received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the School of Visual Arts in New York City. He studied film and video production at the National Academy for TV Arts and Sciences at CBS Television in New York and attended the Black Studies program instructed by Dr. Leonard Jeffries at the City College of New York. Charles learned computer science, desktop publishing at the Rhode Island School of Design. And currently he is the chairman and managing director of the Middle Passage Medallion Project, committed to marking those locations in Rhode Island connected to the triangle slave trade. So without further ado, um, welcome Charles. Hello, how are you? Uh, but I, I just have to make one correction. I'm the executive director for Rhode Island Slave History Medallions. I started with the Middle Passage and I oh. I, I see uh, you've got Ms. Johnson there who uh, started me out very stealthily in uh, by first uh, presenting uh, the whole idea and the concept of marking port markers throughout the state of Rhode Island. And, and I uh, uh, was with her in the first meetings in Providence. And uh, naturally, I'm working with her and coordinating with her in Newport for the medallion project there. Uh, I've, I've been hearing uh, bits about the, uh, the, uh, the medallion projects, I mean, the port marker projects in Bristol. And I'm very excited but I got so overwhelmed with the medallion project that I haven't been able to give her the proper attention that I should towards the uh, Middle Passage project. But, uh, well, we talk all the time and we're like family. So, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's good that she's here and I'm very proud of the, the work that she's doing and, and I'm glad every time I see her and get support for her for this uh, medallion project. So uh, let me tell you just a little about it. Uh, um, oh, oh, do I need notes? Oh, no, maybe not. Uh, so anyway, I'm Charles Roberts, uh, the executive director for Rhode Island uh, Slave History Medallions. And we're a place-based education program. Uh, and what we do is our, our mission is to uh, uh, place medallions at locations throughout the state of Rhode Island that are, have slave related history and the development of the economic uh, state of Rhode Island through the enslavement of indigenous and African-American people. 
um, what our, our QR codes, uh, what our, our medallions are equipped with QR code technology so that when you go in front of a, a medallion uh, with your phone, you just click on it and all the information about that location comes right up to your phone right in front of you. Oh yeah, we got some pictures there. Uh, and, and that's what the medallion looks like. And there's the QR code, you can see it right there. And uh, we're, we have locations at uh, uh, the first one, which was at Patriots Park, which is near and dear to me. Yes, oh, thank you. And, uh, uh, and we had a fabulous celebration there. Uh, it's very important to me because uh, uh, my uncle, the late Paul Gaines was uh, instrumental in putting this medallion there along with the NAACP and, and my family and, and, uh, uh, and Victoria was a part of it at, at that time. And so to have a medallion uh, uh, at this location while he was still alive uh, was very important to me. When I first uh, saw this location, when I was a kid, and I mean a kid, <laughs> it was a rock. There wasn't all of that uh, beautiful uh, work that you see there. So uh, uh, it's near to dear and dear to my heart. The uh, next uh, location that we did was at uh, uh, at uh, at at, at, at uh, um, Bones Wharf. A little nervous, excuse me. And uh, there, there's the location where slaves were first brought into Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Uh, is a location, and that's why there were four port markers there uh, proposed for here, where slaves were brought into the state and uh, used for free labor. And uh, it's, I've lived in Africa and I've been to the uh, islands there. And uh, the, the idea that you lose your, your kidnap from your home you lose your sense of identity and family and family values and brought to a, a continent where you are enslaved and forced to do labor for free because the indigenous people there wouldn't do it and were conquested. It's a very devastating thought and feeling to have on your heart. So uh, uh, that's the, the, the beginnings of it and because uh, during the uh, when the slaves were brought here uh, it was because of this distilleries and uh, yeah I'm sure all of you know the the history of of uh, a Newport and in, in uh, Bristol and why the slaves were brought here and traded for rum rum was distilled here in New England brought on New England ships from Warren and Bristol and Newport and Providence, sailing to Africa, traded for Africans who were kidnapped from their families and brought to the islands to work in the sugar plantations uh, uh, in Cuba and the, and the Indies, I mean, uh, and where they would be worked to an average of 10 years and had to be replenished. And then the sugar that was, uh, was manufactured there was brought to uh, locations like Newport and Bristol and distilled into rum and then brought back for more slaves who were brought back to the islands and traded for the sugar who came here and called the triangle slave trade. That's why how it was created. And uh, that's the fact of that, those arduous uh, travels. 
So anyway, uh, what we did here, what we do is we place medallions at locations across the state of Rhode Island in the 25 cities and locations where uh, enslaved people were used for free trade uh, labor. Mm -hmm. um, and over the years we've found that, I mean, the significance of this is that because it became the economic development of, a, of, a, of the state, uh, because it had no, uh, we didn't have such fertile few, uh, uh, soil as they did in the South, uh, it was necessary to have slave labor here to produce in the, in the uh, like in South County, the, the cattle and the, uh, the uh, cheese and and the wool that had to be supplied to the islands to make sure that this slave trade could continue. It was an economic engine and everyone was involved in it. And that is really the significance of why it became so prevalent and difficult because it's easy to say, oh, look at those people down in the South, what a horrible thing they did to those people down there as, as they enslaved them. But uh, <laughs> the truth is that it started here and was really brought there. I mean, and unfortunately that's the hypocritical uh, side of uh, our New England history. Charles, how, how did you come up with the idea specifically for the Rhode Island Slave History Medallion Project? Well, you know, uh, being raised here in Newport, I used to go down to uh, Van Zandt uh, uh, and jump off the pier. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I'd go to the, to the park, uh, uh, God's Little Acre where, you know, I, I would see all these gravestones, but as a little kid, you just, it's a great place to run around and play in. And then decades later, after living in Africa and uh, South America and uh, seeing the plight of uh, indigenous people and people of color, uh, I was walking through God's Little Acre and all of a sudden I looked around and I, and I realized I was in a sea of angels this beautiful tapestry of, of uh, carved gravestones. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just, it just, it just uh, overwhelmed me. And that's what inspired me, if you roll down one more, uh, uh, to see the first image that really affected me, which is the image of Pompey Stevens. And once I saw that, I, I just could not uh, uh, get it out of my mind. I was so inspired. So I had to learn all about them, all about these angel images. And because I saw them everywhere. After you see them once, you realize they're every place you go, every town, someone has a gravestone and the graveyard with these angel images in them. I mean, so, so anyway, I went to, uh, to, to find out what they were. And I found out that they were called soul effigies. Now, uh, that was all she wrote for me because I was raised in Baptist church and I was raised on gospel music. And uh, uh, one of the, my favorite groups was the Mighty Clouds of Joy. And uh, of course, uh, Aretha Franklin, the queen of soul. So to have this, essence, this uh, understanding of a, a soul effigy, I had to know what they were, a winged soul effigy. And uh, I've, I, so I did some research and I found out that uh, the soul effigy is during the uh, year, the time of the awakening here in New England, uh, when, uh, uh, when the Puritans strayed away from uh, an exacting uh, look at uh, the suffering that 
was about about being involved with religion and started to see that uh, that uh, a more organic approach and they looked at these angel images as being carried away uh, uh, on the wings of angels to heaven and uh, that all God's children were carried away uh, to the heavens in death. It's a, it's a universal symbol. Uh, in every culture, you see winged angels. So uh, the committee decided to choose this image as this image to represent all of Rhode Island and all peoples who uh, were involved or wanted to be involved in understanding a culture of our history and the development of the economic development of the state of Rhode Island through the use of enslaved peoples. Okay, and and you know why why is this why is this project so important to you and your committee? Why why are putting these markers um, in different locales throughout the state something that's important to you? Well, you know, I mean, just look at the times that we're having right now, the disunity that we're having. There has to be a unifying force somewhere. This is a universal image. This image and this uh, history of the, the lives and deaths and stories of the people that uh, created this state needs to be known. And these stories of Africans and indigenous people are truths that haven't been told. They're the unvarnished truth about our history. So it's important for us to learn this history and put it out there because so it could bring people together. And so our children will uh, know before it dies, these stories, that this actually happened and actually took place and that that if they wanted to see and learn uh, about their past, because you, and I learned this a long time ago, my family taught me that if you don't know your past and you don't know where you came from, you sure don't know where you're going. <laughs> and I was lucky because my mama made sure I knew where I was going and that I was going to get there uh, with some common sense in myself. So I was very fortunate to be taught about people like uh, Newport Gardner at a very young age. And, uh, and, and, and I mean, it's, so uh, I got an opportunity and I've traveled by the way in five or, and lived in five or six countries. Uh, I've lived in Africa, I've lived in Brazil. And it's something that you have that you bring with you when you know who you are because of where you came from. I mean, uh, uh, coming from a, uh, a country that was a rather racial uh, uh, place and a disturbing place during the 50s when I was growing up was difficult. But even that, I still was an American and uh, I was treated with respect as an American and, uh, and, and because of that, I love the fact of where I was born. And I was born in Newport, Rhode Island. My family came here in 1889 from Virginia, Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, my great, great grandfather, the first thing he did was uh, he, uh, bought some he bought some land and built a house. And, and, and because he was a landover, he could vote. And that was extremely important to our family. And uh, so we always were people that contributed to our community. We were the oldest uh, transportation service in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, they were delivering, uh, 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 <laughs> they were de delivering the uh, suitcases and the baggage from the people on the ships. Uh, on, on Bellevue Avenue by horse and buggy. And I mean, I'm very proud of that. So, uh, and I let my kids know that because we need our intergenerational relationship so that kids can have a strong foundation to grow up on. 
Thank you. And you know how you know I've I've noticed that in the past year the um, slave history medallion project has really picked up a lot of steam, and you've made a lot of progress. Um, can you tell us how this has kind of evolved into a statewide program and and the funding that you've received? Oh yeah, well you know I mean one of the things that uh, the uh, about New England that makes it so nice. We're, we're all uh, neighbors. We're, this is a small state. So everybody kind of knows each other. And I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, be recommended by Marvin Abney uh, uh, and Lauren uh, Carson to get a resolution as a statewide education program uh, in uh, with the state in March. And uh, uh, from there, I mean, uh, it brought a really serious state of pride and respect uh, to me and uh, my family. Uh, so I think we have, we have Mar do we have Marvin Abney's picture up there? No, oh, uh, no. Marvin and, oh, that's too bad. So, so anyway, uh, they brought me to the state house and they made the resolution to make me a statewide education program. We started, really pushing and our board uh, started pushing, uh, raising money. The first event we did was at uh, a Channing Church. And I mean, uh, we were just talking about slavery in Newport. A hundred and people, 20 people showed up. You couldn't even get in. It was astounding and it really uh, was exciting. And then they asked me, Channing, the people at Channing asked me to, uh, speak at the church. And I said, well, I'm not a preacher, but what can I speak about? She says, anything that about your life. So I spoke about driving while black, what it was like to be an African-American raised in the 50s and, uh, and my mother's biggest fear. And I didn't understand it when I was raised, you know, cause I understood she was kind of like, you know, moms can be with their sons. And, and uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, then, but then when I learned about what driving while black meant, and what it meant was that she was afraid that I would go out there one day in the car and never come back. And uh, uh, that's an experience that black mothers have that maybe no one else might have or understand because it's uh, a, a, a unique situation to people of color for generations, like 400 years. <laughs> so, so uh, therefore, uh, uh, driving while black uh, was an extreme uh, understanding because I, I was able to explain it. And I, I was able to explain what it was like to have a song in my heart that kept me going it, it, so that I would be inspired as an artist and, uh, to create uh, an, a, an accomplishment like the medallion project. Thank you. And I'm thinking if, if it's okay with you, Charles, what I'll do is play that short two minute video about the, with the Smith's castle, um, the installation of the marker there. Is this a good time to do that? Oh, that would be great. Yeah, this would give you uh, the, your uh, group an understanding of what it would be like to do an event at Linden Place. Thank you for coming to the third dedication of a medallion at the Smith Castle. I'm going to say something that's off my original plan. Roger Williams had at least two indigenous servants in 1638. Perhaps he hoped to escape from the ship to some foreign land where he could be free. A brief story about three enslaved men here that served in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. Once for the past, once for the present, and once for the future. 
Katabatash. Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, we, that that was a, a, a really tremendous event. I think I, I think I see Carl Becker as one of the uh, viewers, and Carl is is my commander of the uh, First Regiment, the Black Regiment, and uh, uh, he's always been very supportive. Uh, being with those guys is has been just a, a tremendous experience for me because it was he, they've helped me to experience what it was like to be a, uh, a soldier during the Revolutionary War. And I've joked with him many, many times when he's put that musket in my hand and had me stand at attention and, and, uh, and try, to, try, to, try to shoot it. And I'd say, well, look, I, uh, you know, you don't, if you don't mind, why don't you take this thing back, give me my pitchfork back and let me go back to farming <laughs> because these guys were like, unbelievably it's a, it's an unbelievable feat and an accomplishment that our soldiers uh, accomplished that uh, as as revolutionary war soldiers so carl as you're there i thank you some more <laughs> okay so um you know what we'd like to know to kind of wrap up is is what your plans are for Bristol in 2021, including Linden Place, which we're very excited about. Well, uh, if you look right in front of you there, you see I photographed what a medallion would be like at Linden Place, so that people could walking by could just scan it and find out all the information about uh, what went on there with the Wolf family. Uh, and, uh, and I wanna say that about the, the James DeWolf, you know, uh, of the many slave traders and uh, people that uh, used and uh, profited from the slave trade, uh, there's a lot of uh, negative connotation about him. Mm -hmm. They were, there were people that were worse, but, but you have to remember that this isn't a judgment about who's good, who's bad, or who's better than somebody else. This was the economic development of the state of Rhode Island. George Washington had slaves, you know, uh, Jefferson. Uh, so it was, you're, they're not uh, we're talking about celebrating our history. And we're talking about celebrating the history of a, one of the, the most notorious slave traders there was uh, in the United States. And we're, because we're celebrating our history, we're celebrating as simply as that, our history. And that's the history of all of us. So that's what we're gonna do at, at uh, 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 Linden Place. And what you saw in the video at Smith Castle is similar to what we'd like to do there. Part of the reason that we have gospel singers and gospel music, because that's a part of American culture. That's why we have Revolutionary War soldiers there to honor uh, our, our, our fallen heroes. That's a part of our culture. And that's what we'd like to do at Linden Place, uh, a similar, a ceremony, but we'd like to do it on uh, June 19th or Juneteenth. Why Juneteenth? Because uh, that is when the emancipation of slaves took place. It's a national, it's a, we're, in fact, uh, if it was up to uh, 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 most uh, uh, African Americans, it would be a national holiday because it's a holiday of freedom. And it's amazing that even though uh, Lincoln uh, freed the slaves with, uh, uh, during emancipation, a lot of uh, slaves didn't get the message. Like in Texas, they had to be told that they were free. So this is why we, we really, uh, our first medallion uh, at Patriots Park started on June 19th. And we'd like to have our second medallion, uh, the Honoring Bristol and its slave history uh, start on June 19th. So, Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, Charles. I think at this, at this point, um, I'd like to 
open it up if anyone has any questions. There's already a, a couple up here. Um, do you want me to go ahead and read those out? Yeah, let's 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 do it. Okay. Uh, uh, Gianna Sullivan asks Charles, who made the medallions? Who actually crafted the medallions themselves? Well, the medallions were started out as a, a drawing I made from the Pope Stevens uh, medallion, and then I brought it to. Uh, a good friend, a, a very, very accomplished Warren artist and sculptor, uh, uh, Allison Newsom. And Allison, she just, she just saw it and saw the idea. And it was really something for her to put it down in clay and then help me to understand how to cr uh, craft it. Uh, we had Nick Benson, he helped uh, uh, do the, the, the actual, uh, graphics so the uh, the fonts so that because that that's where Pompey Stevens uh, uh, was uh, indentured uh, I, it, well enslaved actually he was enslaved by William Stevens the the uh, the father of John Stevens who uh, uh, where he learned the craft of uh, making uh, the stone carving and uh, and I want to say one thing about this uh, this uh, very special thing about this particular medallion angel image. Pompey Stevens carved a in 1778 uh, 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 oh 89 I think it was uh, wasn't that 89 78 I think it's 1789 he his brother Cuffy Stevens died. And people think that enslaved people just were enslaved and that was it. They were runaway slaves. They were slaves poisoning their masters. You know, you, you don't take somebody out of their house and then don't, uh, and, and don't allow them to have their own children and take away uh, family values without them being hurt by it. So uh, uh, the, the making of the medallion is almost like a silent protest. I mean, I could imagine him going to William Stan and say, look, okay, I'm enslaved. I'll carve all these statues for you all the time till I die. But this one of my brother, I'm carving for him. And he did, and then he signed it. And that's the act of defiance. Because if he hadn't signed that 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 headstone. that headstone, we wouldn't have had handed down to us the facts that Africans, black people working for the Townsends and and the John Stevens, they were the ones doing the work that actually carved it, and the Williams put their names on it. So we're uh, black people are a part of the actually creation and evolution of the United States, as we call it today. Uh, and, and, and he actually changed the history of decorative art for the Americas by signing his name to that stone. Uh, he actually uh, gave ownership to his family. This is a very significant and very important part of history that needed to be known. Uh, Enslavement uh, is the word that's used, but slavery is the harsh truth, the unvarnished truth. Thank you. Um, Steve Ellison asks if you could give us your thoughts about the uh, recent vote on the removal of plantations from the state name. Well, uh, I, 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 I was on television with uh, the Lieutenant Governor about this. And it's my understanding that uh, from Roger, studying Roger Williams, that the name plantation was a plantation given to him by the king. And when he went over there to uh, pet pet uh, petition uh, for uh, the rights to uh, our lands here in America, that was the name given to large farms. When I say large farms, I mean the size of South County uh, Smith Castle 
has 255 slaves and Indian people that were are buried there. Just to give an idea of the significance of why Smith's Castle is so important. It was the original uh, uh, trading post of Roger Williams. And before it got sold to the Uptikes and, uh, uh, it, a, a, and after the Pequot War. So uh, what I, my feelings about that is, uh, especially since I've traveled uh, and worked in six countries and then I came back to the United States I left uh, Warner Atlantic Electra Records, coming up here to take care of my mother and got a job with the DEM. And I got my first check. <laughs> and it said, Rhode Island in the state of plantation. I like to pass out. I said, I thought I got past this plantation thing a long time ago, like maybe five generations. <laughs> so I thought it was really funny. Not really. So, <laughs> so when uh, the uh, because I've tra I've traveled uh, all over there, and when I go to a, a, a country, I don't say yes, I'm from Rhode Island, the state plantation. I go, I'm from Rhode Island. So, uh, as far as taking the name off, I thought it was just something that time has come. You can't tear down statues and ask to take down uh, uh, Confederate flags and have the word plantation, which now has a, a negative connotation to it, uh, and keep it up as part of representing your state. Thank you. If um, just before I get on to the next question, if people don't know, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat icon. So if you want to submit a question, you can just click on that and type it into the box. And uh, that's how some of these questions are coming up here. Um, the next question is from Beverly Larson. She says, this medallion would help Linden Place tell a wider and deeper history of this place. What impact might we expect from this step? What have you seen happen elsewhere when such a step is taken? Um, I'm, I'm gonna give you an example of Westerly. I was just brought down, uh, asked to come down and talk uh, to the library there about the taking down of a tremendously gorgeous statue of Christopher Columbus. It was carved from that granite, that, that, that beautiful granite that's made only in the westerly red granite. It's like uh, uh, 20 feet high. And they asked me what I thought about that. And, and I had to explain to them that, well, it's, that's not slave history, American slave history, that's colonialism, that's imperialism that happened before uh, uh, or during uh, the slave trade. But my opinion was like this, as an African-American, I'm not gonna be smirch or take down uh, somebody else's culture. I mean, I was raised in an Italian neighborhood I mean, I thought uh, uh, soul food was spaghetti the first five years of my life. <laughs> so, so like, uh, uh, I'm not going, I didn't agree with the idea of taking down a statue there. I didn't agree with taking down the Columbus statue in Providence. And in the same situation happened in, in Newport. Uh, because I'm about building up, not tearing down. And if we're going to unite ourselves as a people, we have to take that stance as just that, uniting ourselves. But I did have to say, and this is in relation to Linden Place, that by putting a medallion there, they became inclusive because they weren't just celebrating the history of the Italians that migrated there in the 20s and, and started the uh, carving of, the, of these statues. But they're also, that was, it's on Narragansett land. So you have to tell that culture story as well. So it's a shared value situation. We're sharing the value of what happened in Bristol, not as a negative thing, but as a historical thing by placing a, uh, a medallion in Linden Place. I know, I, I know uh, 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 
cult, uh, I know families that uh, mixed race families that want to be married at Linden Place because it's a fabulous place. And the idea is almost paradoxical to be married at a, at a place that uh, uh, of the enslaved her is a, a high compliment because it's changing our sense of consciousness. So that's the what I've experienced when talking to people about, gee, Charles, why do you, you know, why aren't you putting those people down? Those people, what those people did to you? Well, no, they did to themselves and to our country. And we have to do something about it by standing up for them as well as ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, there at the moment aren't any more questions here. So if, uh, if anyone wants to ask one, get it up there, but um, Susan. Yeah, I, I would just like to thank Charles for taking the time to put um, this together for us this evening and for including Linden Place and what I think is a very important statewide project. And um, I look forward to working with you as we get closer to Juneteenth in 2021, hopefully with some relaxed restrictions where we can invite a large crowd to come and celebrate the unveiling. So thank you. Well, uh, Susan, if you recall, you're one of the first places that we had our first meetings in, in 2017, right there at Linden Place. So to, it's almost like coming back home to come back here. So uh, I'm, I'm honored uh, to be able to participate. In fact, uh, I have a video that you could show. I don't know if you have that one from uh, uh, Bowen's War? Uh, let's see. Bear with me. I don't. I'm sorry. It looks oh. like it didn't make it in here. Oh. But perhaps I could share it. I could share it on our Facebook or social media um, if everyone wanted to take a peek. Oh, okay. Well, uh, well, it's on our website. If you really want to know what we're doing and keep up with us, just go to uh, risham.org, Rhode Island Slave History Medallions.org. And uh, there, all our videos are up there. There's even videos about John Lewis that uh, people have commented uh, to me about that you might enjoy. So I thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I hope that to be get a chance to uh, I know that, uh, is it Christine? Uh, I know that I'll be working with you when we uh, bring Medallion to uh, Linden Place. And I'm looking forward to wor working and meeting all of you. And I, uh, and, uh, I saw somebody that, that, uh, that I also want to thank. Uh, oh, Jennifer, Jennifer DeWolf, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Good seeing you again and looking forward to working with you in Bristol. So uh, thank you and God bless. Uh, and Carl Becker, are you, be are you still there? I hope, nice seeing you. Jana Sullivan, I know you. Uh, oh, uh, and there's uh, a, uh, uh, Miss Ward from, I think she's all the way out from the Midwest somewhere. And I thank her for tuning in and God bless you. And uh, all I can say is stay safe. Hi, Nan, how are you? <laughs> Thanks, Charles, stay well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the exciting things about Zoom is that um, I know there are people not only um, not in Bristol or in Rhode Island, but not even in New England who are joining us today. So that's that's exciting. It's nice um, in that way, I feel like um, COVID has broadened our reach <laughs> in some ways. Um, and I think going forward, um, whether we're meeting in person or not, hopefully we can have sort of an online portion to these meetings as well. So we can have the audience that, um, that we do tonight. So um, 
So to continue our meeting, what I would like to do is uh, move on to our volunteer award um, without any further ado. Um, I'm going to kind of change up my visual here. Um, so it is always my pleasure every year to give out Linden Place's volunteer award. This award celebrates the accomplishments and contributions of a volunteer who has shown an extraordinary level of service to Linden Place. This year's winner, Phyllis Thibault, is no exception. Phyllis came back to Rhode Island after many years of living in Vermont, um, started giving mansion tours several years ago at Linden Place. Um, she's a retired teacher, and I know most of you know Phyllis, um, so bear with me. Um, but being a retired teacher, um, the transition from teacher to tour guide came very naturally, and that, that was obvious from the start. Um, her knowledge of the mansion's history and her ability to share that story in a truly engaging way is, is unparalleled. Um, visitors are enthralled when they take Phyllis's tours. Um, but more than simply sharing a tour script with a visitor, uh, Phyllis, always with determination, has sought to discover new history and information that helps deepen and broaden her tours and our visitors' experience. Phyllis's curiosity and eagerness to share the history of Linden Place with others has driven her to create an entirely new program of tours. Because of Phyllis, we now have a gardens and grounds tour, which especially during this time of COVID was truly a welcome addition. It meant visitors could take an outdoor tour in our beautiful gardens and learn something new in a really safe setting. In fact, the picture you're looking at now is Phyllis doing a short video um, for our social media, sort of introducing her tour. Knowing that she is such a valuable asset to Linden Place, it was no surprise when Phyllis was tapped to be a board member a few years back. Although her winter excursions to Vermont and New Orleans keep her away from most of the winter, which I'm very jealous of. Um, she has grace, she's gracefully stepped down from the board. She has never skipped a beat when it comes to devoting time to Linden Place. When Linden Place recently took on our examination project or re-examination project, I should say, um, you know, to update our tour of the mansion and make our story more inclusive, Phyllis jumped right in. She has been a huge contributor to this effort um, and this is going to have a lasting effect on Linden Place for years to come. In fact, she even helped update the Friends of Linden Place mission statement. Phyllis, thank you on behalf of the board and everyone at Linden Place for all you have done and congratulation, congratulations on this year's award. I am really honored, Susan. I want to apologize in advance. My internet connection has been wonky all night. So if you can't hear me, that's my internet problem. But I'm really honored to get this. And you you really have embellished everything I do, I feel. But um, Linden Place is really a special place. And as you said, when I came back to live here in Vermont, from Vermont, I really was happy to be welcomed by all of you at Linden Place. I got to know some so many of you, meet so many others of you between you at the mansion and everybody on the board that I met while I was on the board. And just doing the tours now, it's so nice to interact with other people um, as they come, try to explain to them the history of Linden Place and get them to appreciate it the way all of us do. I know we all do, and it's a very special place. You're all very special, and I just wanna thank you very, very much. Thank you for your service. Well, you're there will be award. There will actually be an award coming your way. <laughs> okay, so um, our next agenda is um, the election of new board members. So at this time, I will turn things over to our nomination chair for 2020, Chris Ponder. Hi, can everyone hear me? Um, we have uh, we have three uh, current board members that, because of term limits, are uh, moving off the board. So I'd like to thank uh, those three: Mike Burns, Skip Castro, and Donna Sweeney. 
Um, we uh, have one board member who is moving from a, a board position to an appointed board position for the art museum. That's Peggy Frederick. So we have four new board members uh, that I'm nominating. Um, uh, we'll need a second uh, and then we'll vote on these four. I'm just gonna do it all at once. Um, but uh, Jane Lavender, uh, Natalie Urban, Lynn Smith and Eileen Sweeney. So I'm nominating them. Do we have a, do we have a second? Second. Then Susan, do we just take a vote? Linda, is that the case? We just take a vote at this point? Yes, we normally do that. Um, how would we do that um, in, um, in voice? Uh, why don't you just, I would suggest say all the yays and everyone turn their mics on and inundate you with yays and then <laughs> say any nays and to everyone turn their mics on and hopefully there'll be silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, for, the, for uh, the nomination of the uh, four new board members, um, any uh, yays? Yay. 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 And any nays? Eyes have it. Silence. <laughs> the eyes have it. Thank you very much. Chris, uh, Chris, uh, you have to um, present the slate of officers every year, though. Uh, yes, I have that anyone, too. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I didn't mean to cut you off. I was, I was uh, excited. The, the, Maybe someone the next, the next item is, is oh, um, oh, that's a, a, the next item is uh, just the slate of officers. Um, uh, and Linda, are we are we voting on this or are we uh, am I listing? Um, you are asking if anyone wants to throw their name in. This is usually not anybody, but you know we would entertain anybody who wants to be president, <laughs> vice president, uh, treasurer, <laughs> or secretary. We would absolutely entertain that. Um, and then um, we should do a vote just like we did for the record. Okay. Oh, and uh, one more uh, uh, item that I did forget: we have two um, board members who have a are uh, uh, were appointed through the year, but we need to um, vote on those two, um, Marianne Salesi and Steve Avison. So I'll, I'll um, nominate them if we have a second. A second. Uh, I uh, say aye uh, to, to uh, signify your uh, approval. Aye. 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 Any nays? Eyes have it. Thank you. And then any uh, anybody on um, the screen that would like to throw their name in for president, vice president, treasurer, or secretary? Then I am nominating um, uh, Linda Dubois as president, uh, Chuck Millard, vice president, Gary Holmstrom, treasurer, and Ralph Kinder, secretary. You looking for a second? Need a second. Do I have a second? Second, yeah. Everyone say aye, who, uh, who, who agrees? Aye. 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 Any nays? Tempted to say nay. That's not gonna get me anywhere. <laughs> what, one nay? Overruled. <laughs> Eyes have it. Sorry, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> and that's it for nominating. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, Thank for doing you, Chris. that. Okay, so um, I believe we have two items left on our agenda for this evening. First, I have sort of my director's report, which is essentially a recap of 2020. And then I believe Lyndon Place's treasurer, Gary Holmstrom, would like to give a report um, on Lyndon Place finances. Gary, would you like to go now? Is that, does that work for you? Yes, very good. Can everyone hear me? Anybody? Okay, I'm seeing heads going up and down. Uh, being a treasurer during this time has been fun, but it's been uh, easier because Susan has made it um, 
exciting with grant money coming in with oh. uh, trying to keep tabs of all the shifting incomes from the weddings so i am going to just briefly go over a couple quick numbers i don't want to inundate you if you want to look at more data you should have seen those in your emails and you can see those um, in the files and susan where do you have them? Is it Google Docs or is it, um, it is Google Docs? I, I have emailed um, to all board members, um, but I will upload to Google Docs tomorrow morning. Very good. So at the end of this, I will uh, recommend uh, that we approve the 2021 budget. That budget is based upon the results of this amazing year which uh, I thank everybody for pitching in to keep Linden Place going. It's been a, an interesting experience, but we are, we're making it. Uh, first thing is that uh, we only had 14 weddings this year, which means income is down a lot. Also 20 weddings were shifted, nine weddings were dropped. So the bottom line is that um, when you do all of the math with the, uh, 194,000 less income, uh, we're going to be approximately $35,000 short by the end of December. That's remarkable. We started with a budget that was more like 75,000 in the whole. We, Susan worked that down to about 51 and here we are. When the receipts come in, we're gonna be about $35,000 short. We have to figure that out in the month of December, how we are going to make up that difference. Now, there is some more income, which we hope will uh, close that gap, but we have to continue working that. So um, there are lots of grants that I talked about. I don't want to go over all of those, but one of the biggies is the payroll grant, which Susan was able to get to uh, keep payroll coming in so we can keep people going. Um, we've also had lots of other very nice gifts, like the audio tour gifts. It's about 8.5 thousand, thanks to uh, three very generous donors. Um, I would like to say also that we had to pull 35 thousand from the Shepherd Endowment earlier, and that was to take care of uh, some capital improvements, things like the hot water heater, the uh, courtyard resurfacing mansion re, uh, repair to the roof. Um, and we still have other things going on. Hats off to the people who uh, work to work on the foyer, the conference room, uh, the gazebo, working on the spring house and lots of other things. Let me go into 2021 now. Uh, so you know where we start in the hole a little bit. But the Shepherd Endowment, is down $126,000 uh, this year. Stock market is a lot of that, but we also withdrew 35,000 earlier during the year. Uh, and that uh, makes the total down uh, of $126,800. So I recommend no withdrawals in the coming year of 2021 unless we have necessities and matching gifts. Um, Susan is working on that now. Uh, for the budget in 2021, a few highlights only is that this budget is, has 3.5 people uh, on staff. So that would be Susan, Mark, and Joe. And the other half we talked about last month, and that was to bridge the uh, transition from solely Linden Place uh, bookings for weddings as we shift to a, um, uh, a dedicated cater a caterer, which will happen sometime next year, but we also have to work those weddings ourselves. Uh, and that's gonna take some bodies because Susan can't do all that herself. There are some um, items that must be addressed in terms of capital. One of them is the ballroom cupola. That's about 20K estimate. Hopefully we've got a grant uh, will come in 
or 10K, and we'll have to make up the other 10K. But that's the kind of thing that we have to do uh, or else we get too much damage. And we don't want water leaking on the bride's tables uh, at dinner. Bad show. Uh, so bottom line is uh, we have a, uh, expectations of about, Susan estimates about uh, 45 events, about 300,000 income. Uh, lots of expenses, of course, but we have a, a negative balance going in of about $9,000. That is uh, pretty good. And we hope that we'll be able to make up some of that difference also. Uh, so I'm going to recommend that we uh, submit and approve the uh, 2021 budget. And I'll leave that up to uh, Linda, how, how she wants to do that, whether we want to have another meeting sometime in December, whether we want people to look at these uh, numbers and uh, ask questions. I'd be glad to answer them on phone. Uh, I prefer not on email because it gets too hard uh, on the phone. Hey, yeah. Gary, um, I, you, thank you for your presentation. Um, for this meeting, that would be informational and we will have another board meeting. We, we've not really had like executive meetings, full board meetings. We'll have a full board meeting in December, which um, I don't have my notes here, probably is the second week in December and we can vote on the budget uh, with the board at that point. I think that's a, that's a good, good move. Um, and that's a reminder to all new board members, if you could get your contact information to Susan and she'll send it to me and I'll make sure you guys get invites and agendas for that meeting. That, that way we don't bog up this meeting with the yays or nays. We have a little better count on a smaller group. Is that okay with you, Gary? Certainly, yes. Great. And just so everyone knows, the um, meeting is scheduled for uh, Wednesday, December 16th at 7 p.m. Thank you, Susan. Okay, so um, at this point, I think I will um, do my executive director report. If you can bear with me as I pull this up. I think I X'd out of what I was supposed to. So let's see. Okay. So, you know, we did update our mission statement a bit this year. So it's not a huge shift, but there is a, a bit of a wording change. So I wanted to just um, let everyone kind of see that um, who might not have been in on the meetings or the discussions. Um, just to remind everyone that, you know, it's the mission of the Friends of Linden Place to engage the public, um, to preserve and promote its treasured landmark property and to ensure its public accessibility by developing programs that augment the artistic, cultural, historical, and educational resources of the community. So, you know, usually when I do this report, I, I kind of put everything into different buckets, you know, things that we did, capital projects, um, cultural programs, partnerships. This year was such a unique and interesting year that it was, it was just so different than a normal year that I, I figured what I would do this year is just kind of take it month by month and kind of bring you through what Linden Place went through um, since January, 2020. Um, the electrical upgrade to the mansion was a huge, um, huge hurdle that um, we finally overcame in 2020. Um, very exciting, the work began almost, you know, right after the 1st of January. Um, this included wiring from the basement all the way to the fourth floor. And, it, you know, this is a project that not only helps to ensure the safety of the mansion and its collections and the people who visit and work at Linden Place, um, but it's also something that um, 
helps us to be more attractive to important things like insurance companies. Um, knob and tube wiring from the early 1900s for some reason wasn't, wasn't very <laughs> highly thought of <laughs> by insurance companies. So this was a really um, big project to accomplish and we were able to do it completely through foundation funding, um, specifically the Champlin Foundation and the Felicia Fund. So we have them to thank uh, for this project. Oh, and I, I do want to go back because if, if you can see sort of the structure around the chandelier in the dining room, that is something that Mark, our caretaker, completely constructed so that the chandelier could be moved. Um, they could work above the ceiling of the chandelier and then have the chandelier um, in, reinstalled. It was truly an amazing contraption he built to do that all safely. Also in January, we finally con, you know, finished the restoration um, of our 48 windows and the installation of storm windows. This was a multi-year project. It came to about $150,000 when all was said and done. And the windows are beautiful. If you look to the far left, you can't even tell that there are storm windows there. They're completely invisible or almost completely invisible. Um, this was done through a matching grant. With the that. For some reason, I'm not seeing that uh, visual. Is, am I missing? Me either. No. What do, I, what do I need to do? Help. I don't know. Did it? It's not it's showing up. I'll see it. It's just me. No. No, no, Susan, you, Susan, you're not presenting. Oh, OK. All right. Let me let me go back. Do you want us to pull it up? But is, is something you can pull up. We can pull up from our um, email because I'm a Zoom queen. I do have two screens in front of me. Oh. I don't know what I did. <laughs> That's okay. what we do in school. Two screens. Two That's screens, good. microphone, and camera. 30 kids at the other end. Piece of oh, cake. There it is. All there right. You go. Got it. OK. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> so um, it won't let me forward, though. Hmm. I obviously did yeah, this. Dumb. I have it so in a um, kind of a pages app. Our pages in Google Docs, and it's not. I guess it's not. Are gonna you, let me... you presenting a tab, Susan, or not the screen? Present a tab. It might let you um, go through it. Okay. Let's see. Nope. Sorry, everyone. It's nice. <laughs> it's pretty. So you see this, but I, oh, is that working? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I don't know That's what I it. did. Thank you for bearing with me. So did you, you didn't see these pictures either? Just no, now we do. Oh, That's good. The electrical pictures. Um, the storm windows off to the left that was were the um, invisible storms that I was talking about. Um, this project not only protects the, the windows themselves, but um, helps us with energy efficiency we almost immediately saw a drop in um, the cost of our heating bill once these were installed. Um, February, you know, while we were doing the electrical project, um, you know, we decided it was, and the board wisely decided that it was time to actually rewire the Buckingham Palace chandelier that hangs in the dining room. So for many years, that chandelier has um, sort of half worked, half not worked. It's been, you know, a little quirky to say the least. And in order to prep it for rewiring, um, hundreds of glass crystals needed to be removed. So here we have Joe and we have an intern um, from last winter removing them and also adding tags so that each crystal could be, um, you know, rehung in its exact position when it was done being restored. So this is, this is that contraption I was talking about where um, the chandelier was actually removed from the beautiful plaster medallions um, so that it could be rewired. And then, you know, this is Chris from Chris's Lamp Repair who actually did 
an amazing job rewiring the chandelier. February also volunteers making it happen. So Gary touched upon this a little bit. Um, you know, the conference room, you see a couple of pictures was completely um, redone and can be used, can be rented out as a conference room space, can be used by Linden Place as a, a really great spot for meetings. Um, it will be used by our exclusive catering company to you know, meet in professional ways with our wedding clients. Um, it, it just looks amazing. If you haven't had a chance to see it, you can pop by and check it out. Um, at the bottom right-hand corner, um, we finally um, had the bench um, for the Bosworth Garden installed this past winter, which, um, you know, that is always a work in progress. Um, and the progress has been spectacular, um, but the bench was just a, a lovely addition. Um, and that was donated um, by the Bosworth family. Moving on to March, um, you know, this was right before the shutdown. We had, you know, some really wonderful concerts. Um, we had a very successful garden talk and then COVID came and changed everything. Um, and, and like everyone else, we you know, shut our doors to the public and um, worked predominantly from home for the first couple of weeks. Um, but work continued at Linden Place, um, you know, because of COVID, uh, you know, we tried to move forward with projects that we knew would be difficult to do at any other time. And I think that the resurfacing of the courtyard is um, just a phenomenal project that was completed this March. Um, it was a very rough surface. There were a lot of cracks. It was a little unsafe and um, it was completely resurfaced. And if you haven't seen it, it looks beautiful. And in the long term, will save us um, over $3,000 a year from flooring that we used to have to rent in order to do our special events. Now we have a beautiful floor that um, we don't have to cover up and hide. You know, you start to see some familiar faces here because I have to say Gary and Paul, um, you know, really got projects done this winter uh, on an enormous scale. So once they were done with the conference room, um, they moved to completely um, painting and cleaning up the front porch of Linden Place that heads into our gift shop, which is essentially everyone's first impression of Linden Place. So it was just wonderful um, for this to get that fresh coat of paint. Um, it looks spectacular. Uh, moving into the spring, April and May, our doors are closed. We weren't able to host people for tours or for our usual bustling schedule of events. Um, you know, so we started doing things in different ways. And one of the things we began to do um, were um, virtual tours and virtual concerts. Um, Joanne Merman on the right is a longtime tour guide and volunteer. And she started sort of this take a look virtual mansion tour. So every couple of days we would post tours. A lot of times they were of behind the scenes places that normal tours don't get to see. Um, she told stories that perhaps you don't always, you know, hear about on a tour. And, um, it was just a lot of fun and, and we got a great response. Um, concerts, you know, as, as we all know, concerts, especially our concerts with Michael DiMucci are typically a huge fundraiser for Linden Place. And um, we were able to do that for the first time virtually. And Michael did an amazing show in the ballroom. You can see Joe helped record um, the uh, concert live. We, it was live on Facebook and we received over $2,000 in donations, which was huge for the first time we had ever, we had ever done anything like that. So, you know, it was a learning lesson for us, you know, that, you know, embracing these, um, this technology, um, get a little smoother at it, which we are. And, um, you know, like this meeting, just kind of open ourselves up to new audiences. Oh, here we go. Um, 
Also in the spring, you know, we began to collaborate with other Bristol organizations. So if you came by Linden Place this spring, there was amazing sculpture scattered across the lawn, um, all done by Bristol Art Museum. Uh, we had weekly yoga classes in the gardens um, with Bristol Yoga Studio who were not able to do yoga classes in their studio. They needed to be outdoors. So what better place than to, um, you know, do a class um, in the Sculpture and Rose Gardens on a summer Friday morning. Um, and then our classes, Bristol Art Museum, their classroom size was just not quite big enough to be able to do classes. Um, so we opened up our um, gardens to them this summer as well. And it was great just to, you know, even during, you know, this difficult time of COVID, um, you know, Linden Place remained active in a very safe way. This is, this is, you know, something I'm particularly proud of in terms of Linden Place as an organization. So, um, in June, we began to do a complete re-examination of the Linden Place tour. Um, we realized, you know, when this tour was put together in 1989 and 1990, it was done by a very knowledgeable, hard group of people, um, but it hadn't really been touched since. And in 30 years, there was, there was quite a bit of information that needed to be updated that we perhaps want to include or don't want to include. Um, so we just wanted to begin this complete re-examination of the tour, um, you know, to bring the story up to date, make sure that it's fact-driven, make sure that it's focused and that people are having a truly engaged um, educational experience. And the outcome of this will be several fold. One will be um, a very exciting audio tour, much, like what you experience if you go to Blythewold or to the Newport mansions. Um, this is something that people can do from the comfort of their own home or you know, coming through Linden Place. And that outreach is, is really, really important. It will also allow us to do you know, our specialty tours, you know, to do our women's history tour, to do tours focused on the architecture and the triangle slave trade. Um, and, and this does not mean that we won't have tour guides. Tour guides are a huge part of our organization. Um, audio tours is, is something that um, you know, augments a tour guide that we can use in addition to tour guides. Um, because frankly, tour guides can be a little hard to find. So once we moved into July um, and then into fall, there became sort of this new normal at Linden Place. Uh, we were able to reopen our doors in a limited way for tours by appointment. Um, so we, you know, implemented cleaning measures. Um, we implemented a system where one group of people, one pod of people could go through the museum at a time. Um, because our walking tours are outdoors completely, we're able with smaller numbers to begin doing those tours. And Phyllis um, and Robin really stepped up to the plate. We were hosting those tours um, three, sometimes four times a month, and they were all selling out. So that was, you know, a, a little shining light in an otherwise pretty quiet time um, where the, you know, the really high demand for um, these walking tours, the garden tours. Um, and it was nice to see that in, a, you know, a very small, simpler form, we began to be able to host weddings again. <clears throat> they were very different from what we all imagine weddings to be. Uh, but we were able to do them in a safe way. Um, we had no incidents and, um, you know, we look forward to, um, you know, a very bustling 2021 wedding season. October was a great month. Um, October, very, at the beginning of October, um, we had Rose Weaver and her Honeysuckle Band. And I know quite a few of you were there. It was a beautiful evening. Um, the weather cooperated. Um, the setting was gorgeous. Um, Paul, our volunteer, had completely painted the buildings that you see, the courtyard that you see. Um, 
and Rose Weaver put on such a great performance. And once again, this was Linden Place, um, specifically a small um, committee, including Jane Lavender, Peggy, and Mary Ann Salisi, um, who organized and put together this really fabulous concert of a caliber that um, you know we haven't really been able to do before. Art El Fresco. So Bristol Art Museum hosted Art El Fresco on um, Linden Place's front lawn, brought several hundred people to Linden Place. And then we had our hauntings tour in self-guided fashion, thanks to a wonderful volunteer and recent um, museum studies grad, Elizabeth Iacono. Um, once again, you know, we just, we stepped back and said, you know, just because we can't do things the way we always have doesn't mean we can't do them. Um, so it took a little work, but um, people love these tours. People loved these experiences. Um, and I do believe it, it really kept people coming to our doors. So here we are, it's November. And, you know, what's, what's really exciting is, is that we did receive a $25,000 take it outside grant from the state of Rhode Island. Um, what that means is we can spend that $25,000 on supplies and equipment needed to do outdoor events during the month of December. And we have quite a lineup of events planned. Um, so you can see here the Artisan Fair, Concerts, Family Day, Cocktail Series. We all know that, you know, with COVID's, um, you know, surge at the moment, things are looking a little unsteady. But these are outdoor events that we hope um, you know we'll be able to move forward with. And I should mention once again that these events, these um, all the events that you see listed here, are being completely planned by you know a small, very hardworking committee. Um, it, it's just amazing what they've been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. This is also exciting, Ex exclusive catering partnership with Russell Moore and Fine Catering. Um, you know, Linden Place um, over the summer started looking at, at different caterers. Um, after, you know, thinking we were going with one caterer and then stepping back and deciding to go in another direction, we have officially settled on Russell Moore and Fine Catering and events. And um, I'm very, pleased with how that transition is going. Russell Morin's crew will eventually take over completely the wedding sales of Linden Place. Um, we will, of course, be the venue and be in charge of caring for our venue, but they will take care of, of, of every other detail, um, from booking the brides to holding their hands to, um, you know, coordinating their ceremonies. And this just means, um, you know, that Linden Place staff can really focus on what's important to Linden Place, our programming, our fundraising, our development, um, our outreach, and not have to worry about the huge, um, the huge oversight of what is, you know, anywhere from, you know, 30 to 50 weddings a year. <clears throat> so to finish up, um, just to give you a sense of what is planned for this holiday season at Linden Place as part of that Take It Outside program, um, I think this, this shows sort of what an ambitious lineup we have going. And I really hope that you'll all have a chance to attend one or more of these. Um, they're tented, they're outside under a tent. There are heaters, we have fire pits. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, we also need a lot of help doing some exterior decorating. So if anyone here has um, a little free time on Friday or Saturday, um, come down, you know, even just for an hour or two and help us install some of the, you know, white twinkle lights that you see there. And looking ahead to 2021 and beyond, I think Gary already mentioned that the ballroom cupola is a big um, priority. Um, you can see, oops, um, a little bit of picture, you know, you can see a little, you know, the weather vane, some of the weather damage that's been done to the cupola over the years. Um, we are applying for a grant um, 
for $10,000, which means Linden Place will match it. Um, the coach door repairs, and, and there is some mansion roof work that needs to be done as well. So capital projects are always kind of at the forefront of our mind, and um, we hope to get those accomplished in, in the coming year, maybe 2022. And just to finish up, uh, I just really, um, I sound like a broken record, but I, I really just want to take a moment to thank all the Linden Place volunteers and, and that volunteers, board members are volunteers. Um, you know, you're all so giving of your time and so hardworking and everything that's gotten done in this past year of COVID is, has been done because of all of you. So thank you so much. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, a really great rebound once we get well into 2021. <laughs> thank you so nice um, job susan really nice presentation oh thanks thanks for listening i know everyone's probably kind of mentally done for the day at this point so i appreciate you staying on <laughs> <laughs> um i i think at this point unless anyone has anything else they'd like to add i i think we can um sort of officially end for the evening Thank you, Susan. Thank I'm everybody. Sorry, um, this, this is Eileen. For coming. Um, I just have one question. This is Eileen. Um, just as a new board member, um, Susan, the things that you talked about, um, would we be able to see them, um, some of the things in detail as to um, how your projections, at least for weddings and things like that, affect um, the budget for Linden Place? Do, do we get that sort of detail or? Um, we and will just yes. an overall general view of things. Yes, we are, we are in the early stages um, with Russell Morin at this moment. Um, you now we're in transition. So, and, and because we got into this agreement with them so late this calendar year, it means most weddings in 2021 are, are already set in stone. You know, we have caterers of all sorts. So really the um, arrangement with Morins will really truly affect the bottom line and the Linden Place budget going into the 2022 year. But yes, they will be giving us, um, I believe monthly reports and projections, um, including, uh, you know, Linden Place's receipt of what I believe is, um, about 8% of revenue of their food and beverage revenue. That's fantastic, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Just as a reminder of the new board members, get your um, addresses and emails and phone numbers to Susan and Susan, if you can compile that and just send it to me and I will um, get everybody on the list for the next meeting. Hi, Susan, Yeah. can we mention um, the Friday Bristol stroll that the gift shop will be open? Um, stop by, have some Prosecco and little dessert treats and uh, come and um, buy something from the gift shop. Some new items, Christmas items, and also um, Museum Sunday on the 29th of November. Again, please come out. Just visit with us in the gift shop. I think we'll have the fire tables outside and um, Adirondack chairs set up. So please come and visit, come and visit the gift shop. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, there's some really um, great new merchandise in the store. Thank to, thanks to some wheeling and dealing by Jane Lavender, especially some really um, very fun and pretty Bristol items. So, you know, I know um, how we're always kind of looking for that little something, stocking stuffer, um, lots of little things, um, lots of history books. So yes, as Marianne says, please stop in. Um, you know, have a glass of Prosecco and maybe, you know, get going or finish up your Christmas shopping with us.
All right. Well, you're muted. She's Jane's trying to talk. Okay. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that we're looking forward to something sweet, very sweet, coming to the gift shop soon. So um, be prepared for something really nice. So that's all I have to say. Susan, you do a great job. Everyone does. It's an amazing team at Linden Place. I'm really proud to be part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks again for, for being part of the meeting tonight. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions. Um, and um, if I don't see you or talk to you before, then have a really wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Bye, everyone. You too. Bye-bye.